I've been privileged in my life to meet and to encounter some very clever people, some very wise people. And one thing that I found striking about all of them is their willingness to say, I don't know. And more than that is their excitement when they're able to say, I never knew that or I'd never thought of it that way before. The cleverest and the wisest people know the limits of their knowledge and they're not afraid to admit them. The cleverest and the wisest ones are those who are excited to learn more. And that's particularly true when it comes to the things of God. I've always been suspicious of Christians who seem to have all the answers. An unshakable opinion on every topic. A resolution for every doubt and a scripture for every occasion. I've got much more time for those who don't know all the answers. For those who recognise that there are not always easy solutions. For God exists in mystery, we're told that. There are some things that we simply will never know. In fact, I've often found that the folk who are more likely to say, I don't know, in response to any question, have often thought much more, read much more, wrestled much more, prayed much more, reflected much more, and learned much more, and do in fact know much more than those who would often claim to have the answers. I'm sure you're familiar with the quote, the more I learn, the more I realise I don't know. The more I learn, the more I realise I don't know. I'm not sure who first coined that expression, it's been attributed to Albert Einstein and to Aristotle and Socrates and others. It's such an obvious axiom that it was probably even in existence before Socrates too, and he simply quoted it. There's so much to learn that the more that we learn, the more we realise the vastness of what we don't know. And in our text, Zophar, speaking to Job, utters a magnificent statement that relates all of this to God when he says... Can you solve the mysteries of God? Can you discover everything about the Almighty? Such knowledge is higher even than the heavens. And who are you? It's deeper even than the underworld. What do you know? The measure is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. The first of those great truths that Zophar states is the incomprehensibility of God. The more we learn about him, the more we realise the vastness of what we do not understand about him. God is transcendent, far above us. He's so high and exalted, so great and majestic, so wonderful that we can't understand his mysteries, nor can we search out his limits. He's beyond the ability of humans to fully comprehend him. What kind of God would he be if we could wrap our minds around him and his ways? What kind of God would he be if we could predict where he would go and how he would get there? What kind of God would he be if he worked out of the same limited worldview and history that we do? He would be small. He would be like us. He could be rivaled. He could be called into question and it would be right to doubt him. But he is none of these things. He is infinitely big working from a vantage point that we can't even comprehend, with power to execute his plan so great that no one can thwart his will, even for a moment. The chasm that exists between his plane of thought and ours is too big even for words to capture. In his unending wisdom, knowledge and power, he's planned all of eternity from start to finish. Isaiah says this, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And I've made an everlasting covenant with you, and I will give you all of the unfailing love that I have promised. God's thoughts are higher, and his love is deeper than we could ever grasp. We can know something of the depth of someone's love for us by what it costs. We've perhaps each had friends in our lives who've been there and they've been next to us when life is going well, when days are easy and nights are full, only to then see those friends fade away into the background when times are not so good. And part of growing up is learning that there's no depth of love 
if in the relationships of such fair weather friends. On the other hand, there are friends who will sacrifice for us, who will stay with us through thick and thin. This is how we can see the depth of God's love for us. If anyone would sacrifice their love for us, it assures us of a deeper love than if they would only sacrifice just a few bruises or if they would sacrifice nothing at all. But sometimes we're so familiar with God's spectacular love that it doesn't move us in the way that it should. So we have to look at something lesser be amazed at that and then look back to really feel the wonder of the original. There's a story told of a group of prisoners during the Second World War who were made to do hard labour in the prison camp where they were being held. Each of them had a shovel and they would dig all day and then at the end come in and give an account of his tool in the evening. One evening, the 20 prisoners were lined up by the guard and the shovels were counted and the guard counted 19 shovels and turned in rage on the 20 prisoners, demanding to know which one had not brought his shovel back. No one responded. So the guard took out his gun and said that he would shoot five random men if the guilty prisoner did not step forward. After a moment of tense silence, one 19-year-old prisoner stepped forward with his head bowed down. The guard grabbed him, took him to the side and shot him in the head immediately and turned to warn the others that they'd better be more careful than he was. When he left, the remaining men counted the shovels and there were 20. The guard had miscounted and that prisoner had given his life for his friends. Can you imagine the emotions that those other 19 prisoners must have felt? The feelings that must have filled their hearts as they knelt down over the body of their shot friend and prepared it for burial. In the five or 10 seconds of silence that had ensued after the guard had demanded to know whose shovel was missing. That young boy had weighed his whole future in the balance and he chose his death so that others might live. Jesus said in John 15 and 13, greater love has no man than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. And that young boy did just that. And when we hear those stories, we are rightly amazed. We rightly wonder at the love and the courage that someone could feel to make that sort of sacrifice. But consider now, as we turn our thoughts back to the original, what God's sacrifice of love entailed. To get to the point where he could die, God had to plan for it. He left the glory of heaven and took on human nature so that he could hunger and get weary and in the end suffer and die. The incarnation of Jesus in that stable was the preparation of nerve endings for the nails of the cross. Jesus needed a broad human back for a place that could be scourged. And he had to grow it. He needed a brow and a skull as a place for thorns to be pressed down. He needed cheeks for Judas to kiss and for soldiers to spit upon. He needed hands and feet for the spikes. He needed a side as a place for the sword to pierce and from which blood could flow. And he needed it all for us. So when Ephesians chapter 5 says, Christ loved you and gave up himself for you, don't breeze over the words, gave himself up for us. For his love is shown, like all loves, the depth of his love is shown by the costliness of the sacrifice he was willing to pay. And his sacrifice is deeper than we could ever grasp. Back in 2013, 
Mike Scott wrote a love song which was sung by Ellie Goulding. And its title asked the question, How Long Will I Love You? Like so many others in the flush of first love, he wants to express his feeling that this time it's different. This time what he feels is something that will outlast the other loves that he's felt. Other loves have perhaps come and gone. Circumstances have changed, lives have moved on and love has dwindled. But he wants to make it clear in this love song to his new love that this love is different. This time is different. And so he tries to find expression. And the song asks, how long will I love you? As long as stars are above you and longer if I can. As long as the seasons need to follow their plan. How long will I love you? As long as the sea is bound to wash up on the sand. How long will I love you? As long as you want me to and longer by far. So far searches for some similar expression. And he tells Job, it's longer than the earth. Your creator loved you when you were born and he will love you when you would die and he will love you beyond that moment too. God's love permeates your whole life from beginning to end. His love for you will outlast this moment that you're now living. It will outlast your life. It will outlast even the days of the earth. You cannot escape from God's love. God will never stop loving you. There's no time and there's no sin that can trump God's love for us. You could lie, you could steal, you could murder, you could gossip, you could even turn your back on him, but he will never stop loving you. Even after he had been nailed to the cross, Jesus expressed his love to the Roman soldiers who had stripped him naked, who had beaten him beyond recognition. He expressed his love to those who had placed a sharp crown of thorns on his head and mocked him and spat on him and nailed him to the cross to bleed and die. So don't tell me that God doesn't love sinners. The thing is, that we often don't recognise that. Too many times, we, and I too, perhaps me more than others, we compare ourselves to some glorified, perfect image of what we think a Christian should be, and then beat ourselves up for not attaining it. We focus on our sin and on our failings. We say that we can't possibly have or we can't possibly deserve God's love after the things that we've done. But let me remind you and myself now. God loves you simply because he loves you. You don't have to work for his affection. You don't have to set yourself straight before God can pour out his love on you. The father of the son in the prodigal son story ran to his son even though the son had turned back on him. He hitched up his cloak and he forsook all of his dignity to meet him before anything had ever been set right. He didn't know that his son was there to apologise. He didn't care. Because he'd never stopped loving his son. And he was overjoyed simply to see him. Nothing could have ever stopped that father loving his son. No matter how many days he had sat and waited, no matter what the son had done, he continued loving him. God's love outlasts all things. It's longer even than the earth will endure. You see, loving sinners is God's speciality. One of the most subtle, yet one of the most dangerous heresies of our time today is that God loves good people. That God loves Christians. It's subtle, but it's insidious, and it's not true. God does not love good people. By simply inserting that simple word good, the gospel is changed. It's perverted and it's destroyed. No, God does not love good people. 
God loves all people. Jesus himself said, God so loved the world, not the Jews, not the religious, not the church, not the good ones. God so loved all the world that he came. How could God not love his own creation? How could God not love the object of his plan of redemption? While we were yet sinners, Christ came. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, we are told in Romans. That is the truth of the gospel. And it's so much broader than we often choose to remember. God's love is broader than the church. God's unconditional love is not for good people. God's unconditional love is not for us alone. God's unconditional love is for all mankind. God loves us because of who he is, not because of who we are. When you walk out of the hall this morning, every single other person that you see today will be someone that God loves. Over the course of this week, you may come across and you may meet some people you don't like. You may come across someone who irritates you, someone who does things maybe even that you detest, but you will not meet someone whom God does not love, and you will never meet someone for whom Jesus would not have died. Even if you look hard and you find someone who hates themselves even, if you find someone who sees nothing at all lovely within their own being, someone who finds no point in living and who seeks to find oblivion, whether through substance use strategy or suicide, no matter who you run into, no matter how they think about themselves and no matter how anyone else thinks about them, no matter who you run into, you could tell that person that God loves them and know that you are speaking the truth. And so perhaps we ought to do it a little bit more often, if we know it's always true. God's love is indiscriminate. It may be spoken to, promised to, and applied to everyone without exception. Higher, deeper, longer, broader, God's love is higher than the heavens and deeper than the depths. The love of God is beyond my understanding. But as I seek to grow in faith, as Margaret Macmillan put it in her song, Deeper Consecration, with the saints I am now comprehending higher heights and deeper depths of God's love. God's love is longer than the earth and broader than our horizons. There are no limits to God's love. It applies to every ethnic group, every age, every socio-economic category, and best of all, it applies to every degree of sinner, from the bad to the worst, because there aren't any other kinds than the bad and the worst. And it includes me. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever indiscriminate, universal, so that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. What a great God. Higher, deeper, longer and broader. How can we do anything else but praise him for his perfect love?